Hello, my beautiful and intellectually curious love bugs. Welcome back to my channel. My name is Nancy. I am an entomologist, which means that I study bugs, and I live in Ecuador, where normally I'm doing ecotourism, but obviously that isn't a thing that's happening in 2020. Welcome to the final video of almost daily December. I don't have editors, I don't have script writers, I don't have researchers, it's just me, and I managed to get out 15 videos this month, which means that on average, you're almost daily December, I got a video out to you every other day, so I'm pretty proud of that. Make sure that you have the bell icon dinged and the notification set to all, so that way when I'm uploading a little bit more frequently in the beginning of January as well, you also get notified first about the action. Whoop, whoop. One of the things I'm really excited to talk to you guys about is the Ecuador's New Year celebration where you buy or make a effigy, which is a physical representation of the old year, and you shove it full of fireworks and you light it on fire. And if any year needs to be kicked to the curb and lit on fire, it's 2020. So come join me for that celebration. It's gonna be super fun. All right. A couple days ago, I put out a couple videos. One was your assumptions about entomologists, when which you guys gave me a bunch of assumptions, and your, and your questions about entomologists, where a bunch of you gave me questions about entomologists. But then one of you, one of you big-brained love bugs, we use your name here, asked the big brain questions. And that is, no assumptions, but why haven't you guys eradicated mosquitoes yet? I'm assuming it's all like, like peasants? Get with it. Here, today, we are going to answer that question. It is obviously a complicated question because if it wasn't complicated, there wouldn't be mosquitoes, right? So let's break it down. This video might be a little bit longer than usual, so be sure to follow the table of contents so you can jump around to the different sections. And also, if you want to deep dive more into any of this, I have left a bunch of references in the reference section of other articles and scientific papers that you can Raid at your leisure. Today's video is gonna be broken down into five main parts. The first is what mosquitoes are doing in the ecosystem. The, the second is mosquitoes and their development. The, the third is socioeconomics and how that is affecting our mosquito control. The fourth is what we're doing right now to control mosquitoes. And the fifth is some exciting new tech in the future. So without further ado, let's get into it. The first. What are mosquitoes doing for the ecosystem? Because when we start talking about eradicating different mosquitoes, people understandably are shocked and a little bit worried about the implications that that could have. And when people talk about the potential of eradicating mosquitoes, we tend to bring up their ecological importance, that being members of the food chain, you know, their small wiggling thing, good for fish, good for other insects. People also bring up the fact that male mosquitoes pollinate, and they do do both of these things. However, the main role, I would argue, of the mosquito in any biting insect and in any parasite and any disease is top-down population control. They're basically the taxation system on the ecosystem. That's why when invasive species get to a new area, they can get out of control because there are no predators and there are no diseases or parasites to help bring down and control their population. When we start looking at big charismatic megafauna like giant lions and big elephants and sharks, what are taking down those full grown animals? And the answer to that are diseases, parasites, disease vectors. That's what's taking down those big animals. Diseases and parasites are a natural and important part of the ecosystem to help it function. Without them, you get species that get out of control, you get species that have unchecked population control, and that can have other devastating effects on the ecosystem. Unfortunately, with mosquitoes, especially the 30 or so species that have co-evolved with humans, we are their main target, and we are the thing that they are trying to take down trying in quotation marks, right? They're not anthropomorphized. We're gonna talk about them like a little bit more loosely today, a little bit more loosely. And boy, are they good at it. Malaria affects 400,000 people every year. Mosquito-borne diseases kill 1 million people every year. And it's estimated that more than 700 million people are affected by mosquito-borne diseases every year. That's more than twice the entire population of the United States. 
right? Imagine if every single person in the United States was sick with a mosquito-borne disease, I guarantee you that the US would be all on top of that and be figuring out solutions. But unfortunately, as many of these diseases are still problems in developing countries, as much money that should have been put into it, I feel like necessarily isn't. However, there is still a lot of money being put into it all over the world because it is a global health crisis. When we are talking about eradicating mosquitoes, we are not talking about eradicating all 3,500 of them. There's a lot of species of mosquitoes. Most of them you've never heard of. There's this beautiful purple one, for example, it has little pom-pom feet, very cute. But there are 30 or so important species that are affecting human health, and these 30 species is what's affecting those 300 million people every single year. If we are talking about eradicating mosquitoes, we are not talking about eradicating all of them. We are just talking about eradicating the 30 or so species that are affecting human health. Arguably, that is their greatest ecological impact. It's not the fact that they're pollinators. It's not the fact that they're important in the food chain. Their biggest ecological impact is their impact on our human health. So now that we've established that if we did eradicate mosquitoes, or at least the ones that are affecting humans, it wouldn't really affect the ecosystem that much. What are some of the barriers to actually doing it? And the first one is their growth and development. Mosquitoes have complete metamorphosis. That means they have an egg, they have a larval stage, they have a pupil stage, and they have an adult. Very much like a butterfly, except at the end, you don't get a pretty butterfly, you get a blood-sucking disease vector. The larva and pupil stages of the mosquito are aquatic, but the adults are no longer associated with water and are terrestrial and are flying around and are looking for you to get some blood so that way they can process those proteins that make their eggs and lay them in the water and the whole cycle continues. Unlike many other aquatic insects that breathe through their gills and they need high quality ecosystems and streams and water and high water quality, mosquitoes can pretty much live in anything. Everything from a little bit of water in a bromeliad to a small hollow in a tree to that gross dirty puddle to even sometimes just mud is good enough for them or like moist leaf litter. And that's because instead of breathing through gills where the water quality is really important, they breathe through spiracles. They have like uh, the little hole at the end of their butt and all of these hairs that open up like this. So they, so they go up to the surface of the water, they open up those, those little hairs that breaks the surface tension and they just breathe regular air, like a little snorkel kit almost. So that means they can live in really dirty, really polluted water and be just fine. So that makes their control a little bit difficult in the larval stage. The adult stage is the fact that they don't live very long and can fly. <laughs> And unlike agricultural pests are not just going to be sitting on your leaves like eating your ag stuff, they're like flying around and specifically looking for blood meals. So now that we know a little bit about the insect development, let's move on to some socioeconomic barriers. The first is most of these diseases are disproportionately affecting people in developing countries and the countries themselves don't necessarily have a lot of money to put into studying and researching and investing in programs. So a lot of that money and that research is coming from outside of those countries. And it's just not really a priority for a lot of Western countries. We don't have malaria in the States or in Europe. And yeah, we have some mosquitoes that are like a pest and a nuisance in Florida, but that's basically what they are, a pest and a nuisance, and they aren't necessarily affecting our human health. So that's a big part of it, but also just the infrastructure. So like I was mentioning earlier, the mosquitoes, the larva, live in the water, but they can live in basically any point of water. So while in the States and in Europe we have nice roads and we have good drainage and we have potable water that's coming from the government and you know, services that are funded by our taxes, many developing countries don't have that. For example, in Ecuador, in Mampiche, a really lovely beach town that I love doing tours in because the jungle is so amazing, has a lot of these just infrastructural problems. For example, there is no potable water being sourced from a main source from the government, so many people are getting their water from rain buckets. Now, rain buckets are large bodies of standing water. <laughs> which we just established is a perfect breeding ground for mosquitoes. So like, that's number one. It's really easy in the States to be like, hey, clean out your fountain, clean out your bird bath, dump that bucket over. 
very easy, whether people do it or not, like that's another story, but theoretically, it's not that hard because those things like fountains and bird baths and buckets aren't connected to anyone's livelihood. Whereas in Ecuador, large bouts of standing rainwater is how you wash your dishes, how you do your laundry, how you shower, your drinking water. So that's, that's one. Another issue that I see in Ecuador a lot is that our roads are crap sometimes. We have really nice roads, like the main roads, like the main highways are really excellent. But once you start getting out into the jungle or you start getting into some of these small towns, the roads uh, are little more than what my dad likes to call trails. In Mampiche, all of the roads are sand, which is great in the dry season because you just literally like drive right over them. But it's crap in the rainy season when they get washed out, where you get really big puddles, where there's no drainage. So like wa freestanding water just ends up on the side of the roads and the grass. And all that is perfect habitat for mosquitoes, perfect habitat for mosquitoes. So a lot of it is the lack of basic infrastructure to help people where there are mosquitoes just flying around. So that gets us into four, what are we doing to even control mosquitoes right now? And in many places, including here in Ecuador, we use generalized insecticides as a spray to mainly control the adults. And you just spray large swashes of area to kill them every so often. The problem with this is that pyrethroids, which is what we are using to kill mosquitoes, are a generalized insecticide. That means it kills mosquitoes, it kills praying mantises, it kills ladybugs, it kills butterflies, it kills dragonflies, it kills bees, it basically just kills everything. And that's because it's a generalized neurotoxin affecting the sodium ion channels in the nervous system of the arthropod. Unfortunately as well, mosquitoes are particularly hardy, so what it takes to kill a mosquito may be many times higher than what may be necessary to kill a friendly parasitic wasp helping you out in your garden. So the fact that what we do have is so generalized, it's really not good for the ecosystem either. Also in the states where we are spraying and fumigating, that's usually in residential areas and people are obviously upset and don't want to be smelling or breathing in these chemicals. They aren't necessarily bad for us because they don't affect us in the same way, but they still smell gross and you're still worried about your children and your pets. So that's not great either. That's definitely a huge ecological problem. They're just dumping all these pesticides all over the place. We can also use mosquito nets. I sleep under mosquito nets here on the coast because there are mosquitoes and they are annoying, or if not, I'm in a fully screened area. But mosquito nets work really well when you go to sleep. Getting people to use them is another struggle, but theoretically they work really well and they're a very simple and easy solution to make sure that you're not getting bitten by the mosquitoes. But that only helps you at night when you're sleeping. You're not gonna spend like all day in a mosquito net. <laughs> so <laughs> affects you mainly at night. Getting these mosquito nets out to people who need them can also be a little bit of a struggle and making sure people are using them can also be a little bit of a struggle. And many of these mosquito nets, again, are covered in pyrethroids because they kill the mosquitoes on contact. And a lot of people don't like sleeping in them and they can not smell nice and right down the list. Another option that we talk about are vaccines. And yellow fever has a vaccine that works really well. I have my yellow fever vaccine and it covers you for at least 10 years. I think it might even cover you for more. But I have my little yellow thing in my passport that says that I'm covered. That does work really well for some diseases. Things like Zika doesn't have a vaccine yet. And something like dengue has four different types of the virus basically. And different combinations of the virus can lead to really bad and lethal side effects. Like you can hemorrhage out and die because you're bleeding from all your organs. That's not great. So dengue is also a big problem, but developing a vaccine for it has proven to be really complicated because of these four different strains. If you're interested in learning more about that, my friend Joe on Ask an Entomologist has written a little bit about that in one of our Ask an Entomologist articles. You can check it, check all those out in the reference section below. And some things, aren't even viruses. You can't even make vaccines for them. For example, malaria is caused by a plasmodium, which isn't a virus. 
And so you can't make a vaccine for it. Okay, so now we're at number five. What are we doing and what's some promising tech for the future? The first is genetically modified mosquitoes and the other is a genetically modified pathogenic fungus. And if you're scared about GMOs or you're worried about any of this stuff, like calm down, don't panic. We're going to learn about it, right? With knowledge comes power and a lot less panic. So let's talk a little bit about what these are doing. So in 2015, you may have seen when the internet exploded about these genetically modified mosquitoes from a company called Oxitec. And these genetically modified mosquitoes were really interesting because we have been using sterilized insect treatments before. Basically, what Oxitec is doing is making a mosquito that can't produce viable offspring and so therefore the, the female mosquito mates that lays eggs none of those eggs reach adulthood and then keel over and die <laughs> which helps reduce the mosquito population which then helps reduce the chances of you being infected by a mosquito-borne disease we have used sterilized insect treatments in the past many of them have been conducted and been done by subjecting male mosquitoes to radiation and then females mating with these now sterile males. And there's a couple problems with this. The first one is that the males, when they have been blasted with radiation, for whatever reason, are now not a schmexy to the females and they just choose not to mate with them. And the other is that it's really difficult and not necessarily reliable to get mosquitoes that have been sterilized with radiation. There's a lot of other things that can go wrong. So there's been some problems on that aspect. You may have seen the Oxitec mosquito thing come out in 2015, and there have been subsequent field trials. The most recent was in August of 2020 in the Florida Keys, and that area was chosen because it's a residential area that has a lot of mosquitoes, so hopefully we don't have to spray as many pesticides. And also, while mosquitoes may look the same to you and to you know your friend and your neighbor, mosquitoes are all really different, and this is really targeted. A female of one species is not going to mate with a male of another species. So we can really target who we're affecting, which means that we're not spraying as much generalized insecticide that's just killing like everything and their neighbor. Also, it was released in this area because in the Florida Keys, there are many mosquitoes that are now insecticide resistant. So our normal methods of just spraying the crap out of them isn't working. It's important to note that this method will not eradicate mosquitoes because you still have females mating with males. The goal is to reduce the population sufficiently that people aren't getting sick. Gathering data for field trials takes many, many years and is relatively difficult and not as simple as you might think. So we're still waiting to see how effective this is in the field. It's very different for something to be effective in the lab than it is for something to be effective out in the wild. Another technology that's also in its like little baby stages, I would say, is this genetically modified fungus. Fungus that attacks insects is so common in the insect world. I have done an interview with my friend Joni and Brian who study two different systems. Hip here in this link, it's so interesting. Listen to them talk about how amazing fungus is. So fungus is already readily found in the environment. It's already attacking insects. Specific fungus only attacks specific insects, so you're not gonna get weird crossover. So this is all really, really good. This genetically modified fungus has been modified to produce a spider venom toxin. And this spider venom toxin is affecting a calcium ion channel in the insect's nervous system. It only affects insects, it doesn't affect people. I think people don't realize how complicated spider venom can be. There are proteins and venoms that make you hurt and cause pain. There are proteins and venoms that are specifically designed to shut down the insect the insect nervous system, there's proteins and venoms to help spread that effective agent around, like they're pretty complicated. So the research team took one of those specifically that affects the nervous system of just insects and made it so this fungus can produce that toxin. It's producing, it can genetically code that toxin. So you have this fungus that's creating the spider toxin. And that fungus naturally infects mosquitoes. It has the pathways to bore through the insect exoskeleton and get inside and eventually kill it. With this fungus bioengineered to produce this spider toxin, one is something that's naturally found in the environment. We have used fungus for biocontrol 
in many instances, especially in agriculture. And this spider toxin really helps ensure that this mosquito is going to die. This is really important because this spider toxin is affecting calcium ion channels instead of sodium ion channels, which the pyrethroids are attacking. And because we know that many mosquitoes are now resistant or developing resistance to pyrethroids, now we have a toxin that's affecting a different receptor to ensure that this mosquito is gonna die. A paper was released on this technology last year and it's in the beginnings of the field trial stage. They have moved from the lab and made like an enclosed system to test the mosquitoes and the next stage is to tie and test it and see how it's actually working in a fully functioning ecosystem. So there's a lot of potential with these two new technologies, however, they're still very new and we're following the data and we're seeing if they actually are effective or not. Well, my intellectually curious love bugs with very big brains, I hope that you liked today's video and you learned a little bit more about why mosquito control is so difficult and why eradication is so difficult. If you're interested and you want to learn more about the Oxytech mosquitoes or of this pathogenic fungus, I have left articles in the reference section below. If you want any more clarification, feel free to leave a comment asking, and if I can't answer it, I will find someone who can. Maybe we'll make a whole nother video on it. Well, my love bugs, I will see you all very soon. Until then, check out this video that I did with my friend Brian and Joni about pathogenic fungus and check out this video down here that has been recommended to you by the YouTube algorithm. Oh, and I will see you all very soon. Bye.